What's up, Prime Fam? In today's video, I'm giving in and I'm joining the YouTube Trends. We're going to be doing a bench press exercise tier list, specifically assistance exercises only. So I'm not including accessory work. We're not going to talk about tricep work or back work here. I specifically want to talk about the bench press variations that get your bench press the strongest. We're going to be ranking things like incline benching, you know, Larson pressing, uh, your dumbbell benching, all the main exercises or variations that people do to progress their press itself. Now, before we dive into this, though, there's a few criteria to define here. First, what I want to mention is that whenever you're creating a tier list like this, you have to understand when you're viewing this at home, this tier list is going to be biased towards my programming biases. So for instance, I started to watch Bald Omni Man's video on this just to get an idea of how these videos work because I've never really watched these much on YouTube. Uh, but I quickly tuned out of it because I didn't want his answers to influence mine. However, I'm going to have a fun time after this video going over to his video and seeing where we agree and disagree. And neither of us are correct. Neither of us are right or wrong. This is specifically just how we program in our own paradigms and how these exercises align within those programming paradigms. So what might work for him, I'm sure does actually work. And what works for me also works, but you, there's greater context to be talked about when it comes to the programming biases, which is why these videos, in my opinion, are a little lackluster, but I realize why they're fun. So we are going to dive into that. Now I'm going to define the three things that are the criteria for making up the definition of this tier list. And it's very important you listen to this carefully before we get to the fun stuff. So number one, and I'm reading this directly, I wanted to write this down ahead of time. These are lists that I program the most. I generally find these to be the best amongst my average population of my personal athletes, meaning people I've actually coached. I've been powerlifting coaching and strength training coaching for the last nine years, actually, it's weird to say that I'm almost coming up on a decade. So amongst all my time here working with my athletes specifically, again, I'm not talking about other people's programming styles. However, every individual situation can greatly change the ranking of these exercises in relation to the individual lifter. What might be a D ranking on one person could actually be a B ranking on someone else. Exercises are simply tools. And you have to remember that this list isn't me saying these are the best and worst exercises, it's simply saying generally, if I I had to blend this to a population. This is how I would rank it. Number two, this list is concerned with long-term progress. Okay. Not short-term meaning anyone can run a hyper-specific high volume program that makes tremendous progress. However, that can't last for a long time. So, you know, if I took an average Joe off the street, who's never power lifted very much. And you know, they've done their typical five, three, one program or a West side program or whatever. And I just give them a hyper specific, high frequency, high volume bench press, you know, six week program. They're going to get way stronger on that in a shorter amount of time. than if I were to do something more long-term oriented, but this doesn't mean that's better. Obviously they're going to burn out very quickly on that and stop making gains. So you have to understand I'm talking about long-term progress here. Third thing, even throughout a singular athlete's completion of a training cycle, meaning to me, a training cycle is generally 12 to 16 weeks long, sometimes longer or shorter, depending on some you know definitions. But even during just that short completion of their training cycle, you can see a change of rank in these exercises. For instance, an athlete further out from a powerlifting meet obviously will need more movement aimed at hypertrophy, range of motion, you know, weak point training, and someone who's closer to a peaking day or a meet, they're going to need more specificity, right? So it's going to change the list as it goes on. But without further ado, those are my criteria. Let's dive into the actual tier list. Okay, guys, this is going to be really fun here. So we got S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, and D tier. Um, we're going to be selecting from these little boxes down here. I don't have any fancy pictures for this one. We're just going to drag and drop the actual wordage here. I jumbled these up so they're not in any specific order. So you can understand my thought process as I rank these. So uh, we're actually starting off here with a controversial one. I know the USAPL fucking powerlifting scene is going to hate this one, but they can hate it all they want. Incline bench press is going to go right into S tier. Incline bench press was something I never did. Um, like literally ever, uh, sorry, trying to get my face here on the screen correctly. This was something that when I started working with Dylan Smith back in 2019, the end of 2019, he had me incline benching. I was very reluctant to do that as well as overhead pressing. Uh, I had already achieved, uh, over a 400 pound bench press on my own. And it was one of those things where, um, I felt 
at that time, bench press specificity mattered far more than anything else. I was a bit delusioned, I think, by the general population of athlete I was training, which at that time in 2019, I had mostly high level IPF or USAPL lifters, as well as other IPF affiliates. And the majority of them bench press with an extreme arch. Uh, I sent multiple guys to worlds and bench worlds. One of them who went to bench worlds was bench pressing with like literally a four inch range of motion on someone like him. Incline bench press is rather useless, but for the vast majority of you watching this, you don't have a four inch range of motion. So incline bench press for anyone who's got a legitimate range of motion, me being one of them at six feet tall and very lanky incline bench press will help improve your power through the sticking point. You will be able to exert more force without dying out in the sticking point. It teaches better leg drive, which I know you're probably saying how the hell does incline bench teach good leg drive trust me if you've never tried this use a 30 degree seat height to our seat angle and drive the fuck out of it with your legs after a solid pause come in with a soft touch even if you're a sink bencher use a soft touch you're going to get an increase in leg drive like crazy in your competition bench the sticking point's going to be like just you blowing through it man you're going to be able to fight through it i actually did a meet right after working with dylan and doing all the incline work and i had a grinder bench press where i got stuck halfway up because i misgrooved it and the only reason i was able to finish that was all the incline work and then it also works your pec um, excuse me, your pec minor and your triceps and your serratus interior in the synergy of protraction to really help with lockout strength. Uh, I can go in depth in other videos, but just kind of take my word at this incline is definitely an S tier. It is something I literally use with all my clients. I don't have a single client under me that I don't use this at some point. Some clients I use it more for, but everyone at some point is getting some incline bench love. Um, moving on OHP variants. Now OHP is really good, but it starts to drop off as a lifter gets more advanced for some lifters. So I'm going to put OHP in the A tier. Now, I think OHP also like incline gets a little, little bit of hate. The problem with OHP is it doesn't have direct carryover. Neither does, well, actually incline does have direct carryover, but once you get through your first few blocks of incline, it will carry over more in a secondary fashion. And OHP is pretty much all secondary fashion carryover. What I mean by that is if you have really strong shoulders and you get them stronger and bigger over the course of time, there's zero way your bench press doesn't improve. It is a vertical press, very similar to the horizontal press, only you're going in the harder direction. And it's going to really give you that power off the chest. So a lot of people don't understand this. They think off the chest is all about doing close grip work or, you know, explosive work or whatever, but your shoulders actually hugely matter when you press off the chest, as well as when you stick the overhead press lockout correctly, it's going to help with your lockout strength. Because again, you're going to train that upward rotation of the scapula, get some serratus interior in there, some shoulder and trap elevation in there. You're going to get a lot of benefits. So OHP is actually a tier, but as you progress through your training career, it becomes a little less important. Incline, I use a little bit more, or I would say a moderate bit more, but OHP is always a staple in there. And you never want to stop doing some kind of dumbbell overhead press or barbell overhead press. You need to always continuously have that, which is why I think it's an uh, A tier. Now, overload work. You guys uh, who are West Side fans are not going to like this. I'm putting this in D. Uh, this is something I've tried using many times. It sounds so fun to me. I've tried using the slingshot, tried doing reverse bands, tried doing all sorts of things, chains, like you name it. I never like overload work. It just doesn't seem to work. What's funny is actually, I think one of the best things you can do for your raw squat, I've seen a lot of guys progress it, is doing wrapped squats. There's something about doing wrapped squats that makes your back so fucking strong at like holding that position that it has a ton of carry over to your raw squat, at least doing that once or twice, like really learning to use wraps, which is basically an overload for the squat. Bench press, just not the same. Overload work is going to be D for me. Now, again, if, if you get someone who's biased towards programming very differently than me, if they're using a you know West Side methodology or a you know some kind of conjugation, you know, they may have more success with that overload style, but I've just never found it to work. And I really wanted it to. Um, this next one also going to be a D tier, unfortunately grip rotation. Um, this is when I say grip rotation work, I mean like your football bar bench, your reverse grip bench press, like things where you're changing the angle of your grip. So I don't mean like wider or narrower. We're going to talk about close grip variations later. This is just D tier to me. And I think it's pretty obvious why this is so non-specific, even though I am kind of anti like USAPL elitist, like you got to always bench press five times a week kind of mentality. I also don't 
go way over to the other spectrum. I just think football bar benching, for instance, it requires so much damn wrist stability when you go heavy that it's just not going to have much carryover. Doesn't mean I never use it. I have given both of these exercises out to people. I want to be clear here just because it's D tier doesn't mean I never use this stuff. In fact, I recently used some football work for one of my guys and a few, uh, about a year ago, I was doing a lot of overload work with one client. Larson variants, man, this going straight up to S tier. I don't think I need to explain why. I think everyone knows Larson press is just amazing. I specifically like soft touch Larson press, especially for sink benchers, but literally for anyone, if you Larson press, it teaches you good scapula control in your bench press because you have to have a lot of active scap retraction, especially if you're using a soft touch, which is why I always program my athletes. If they're doing a Larson press of any kind, they have to soft touch. Otherwise you lose a lot of the scapula stability benefits. It literally teaches you to engage your upper back the correct way without relying on your forced arch via your leg drive, which I think a lot of people over rely on a depressed scapula and big arch, but don't know how to get active scapula retraction. Um, moving on now. Uh, wow. Another S tier here, dumbbell bench. This one, I know again, I think people would put this maybe in a or B to me, my, I know my bench press. And I think anyone with long arms got the most results. My first like six, seven years of powerlifting from dumbbell benching. I've done up to like 160 pound dumbbells for paused reps. I think pause four. And I've done six reps with the 150s and 155, somewhere around that too. I got really strong on dumbbell benching. And I'm talking full lockout, strict pausing. Not None of that half, you know, tapping on the chest and fucking false lockout crap. I see a lot of guys even like, you'll see some dude on Instagram using 180 pound dumbbells. And it's he's damn strong. But he should be using like 160s for pause reps. But he's doing 180s for like three quarter reps with soft touching and no pause. Don't understand that. But if, if you get this down, the pec activation is amazing. I'm not going to dive into it here, but generally, or, or what you can get from this is essentially removing the triceps with a ton of chest activation. And this has to do with lateral force transfer. I have a lot of videos on this, but because you're not locked into the barbell, the triceps don't fire nearly as hard in this as they do in a regular bench press. So it ensures your chest gets really worked and it's amazing for hypertrophy. This is a, again, a long-term builder and it's something that's always in there. It's joint friendly. You can use this in many programming circumstances. I've even put this during peaking blocks as like a main, you know, tertiary pressing exercise, uh, floor press variants, oh, man, I think I'm going to throw this on B tier. I loved floor. floor press was another one that I found later in my training career. So this one, one day I was just kind of like playing around with shit in my garage gym. And I, I always hated floor press because when I tried it originally, it felt shitty. And then basically lo and behold, I found if I could really melt my triceps into the ground and come to a full pause, the amount of power I had to produce to push that weight up again was tremendous. And it taught me to be very explosive in the bench. The second thing I found is with a slightly closer grip, I'm talking pinkies on the ring or narrower. Sometimes I do a legit close grip of these. You get amazing chest activation. The reason why is your scapula is in a slightly protracted state. You can't retract and arch the way you can on, you know, a regular bench press. And because of this, your end range chest contractions are amazing. So I actually love this for like pump work. I will do like sets of 10 to 15 on these with a closer grip. Dude, I I'm telling you, you might think, oh, it's such a short range of motion. How could it be? Go try it. It feels fucking amazing on the pecs. Um, long pause work. Oh, um, I'm going to throw this in in B tier. This is something I don't program as much these days. Uh, long pause. I used to use probably too much. I'd say like my first, maybe like not my first from year, like three to six, maybe four to seven, somewhere in there of my powerlifting coaching career. Um, especially in the 2018, 2019, 2020 region that I was programming a ton of long pause work because my theory was you got to pause in competition. So the more we practice that, the better these days, I actually look at long pause work as mostly as keeping your pecs healthy and keeping the load reduced. Um, I've found it does not seem to help my athletes in competition. I don't know why, to be honest. Like I remember having one athlete who had legitimate pausing issues in competition. He like just couldn't pause to save his life and would always skip the command or something would go wrong. And so I had him practice long audible pauses and just sure enough on meet day, didn't seem to fix it. What did seem to fix it 
was just slowing down his bench press and working on the technique. And then all of a sudden he got more stable and we didn't need to worry about doing that. So if, if anything, these days I'm a little less of a like pause Nazi with my coaching, but I do think your first few years, it can be very beneficial because almost everyone who comes to me for coaching is doing like touch and go benching and they never pause their shit. So like I will implement this almost always in the beginning just so they get used to it. Um, oh, close grip variance is going A tier, almost S tier. If I could put this fucker in the middle, I would. Um, the reason it's not S tier is because it's not a staple all the time. Um, but at some point during the training cycle, I'm going to throw in close grip work and I like it a ton on just your regular bench press or close grip Larson. Those are my two favorite. It increases your range of motion. Um, contrary to what people think it's more chest and triceps for some reason, people always talk about close grip being more tricep dominant. It is not more tricep dominant period. It's harder in the lockout because the sticking point is increased. Your range of motion is increased, but this has nothing to do with your triceps dying out. This idea of breaking down a movement pattern in like bottom range of motion, middle range of motion and top range of motion is extremely antiquated. I could go into really deep biomechanics as to why your triceps have more to do with lateral force transfer into the barbell bench press than they have to do with locking out. This is why you actually see wide grip benchers usually not struggle at lockout, but very close grip benchers do struggle at lockout it has nothing to do with the triceps. Now it is true. The more you tuck your elbows past about 45 degrees, it will become more tricep dominant because of an extraneous moment arm displaced on the tricep joint. But this is because from a side view, a perpendicular view, you'll see the elbow leads the barbell and this is going to cost your uh, triceps some, but I generally don't program uh, close grip work to be like that. I want you to use a position that's strongest. And that's going to be usually elbows around 45 degrees. And that's actually going to be a perfect position to get even more chest activation. So while your tricep activation does go up, so does your chest activation because it's just generally more work. Your humerus has to abduct now even more than it did before, just like your triceps have to extend more. So there's a lot of misconceptions there. Um, okay. Tempo work. Um, I think I'm going to put this one in a tier again too. Um, tempo work is really good for beginners and intermediates. Probably almost, I, I rarely use this for advanced benchers. When my guys are over 400 pound benchers, um, or just like, you know, three times, or maybe I'll say two and a half times body weight benching. Th that's rarely will I ever use tempo work unless they're just injured. Um, in other cases, like when they're a beginner or intermediate, I use it a lot, especially for my soft touch pressers, but really just anyone to get them to slow down the movement and coordinate it better because most people just try lifting too fast. Uh, Spoto press or Spoto variants I wrote down. So when I say variants, I basically just mean, um, anything that's like Spoto. So it could be a close grip Spoto. It could be a concentric Spoto, eccentric Spoto. There's a lot of different ways of doing this. I'm going to put this in C tier. Um, I almost want to put it in B. No, I definitely want to put this in C. This is a C tier lift. It's just not that great to me. Um, it's okay. I use it every once in a while actually to work on stability, especially for guys who are just really ballistic with their bench press, but that's about it. Uh, and it's also sometimes I'll use it just for pure like novelty for fun, you know, things like that. I do like it close grip a lot more than I like it, you know, your normal competition style grip press, uh, touch and go variants, definitely C tier. I rarely program this unless I need to make a lifter more explosive. That's pretty much the only reason I would do it. Um, it's getting a lot of love these days. I actually see a lot of coaches programming touch and go variants, and I think it's just a new flavor of the year. Um, I don't, I don't see a purpose to it very much. Um, I might let a lifter get away with doing touch and go on say sets of 10 on bench press, um, depending on their situation, but it's not something I, I program, um, soft touch slash ballistic work. Mm, this is going to have to go uh, to D tier. I'll go, I'll go C tier because of the soft touch work. So ballistic work is where you purposely go like super explosive. So not just touch and go, but where you're trying to basically do quote unquote speed work and just push the bar as fast as possible. I haven't used that shit since like, I don't know, dynamic effort West side days when I first started lifting and I wouldn't do it again, but soft touch work, I do think has a place, especially for sync ventures. Now we're left with pushups. I remember when I wrote this in, I thought this was going to be controversial that this was even on the list. Pushups for some people are fucking S tier for other people. They're a, but for everyone at minimum, it's B. So I'm going to throw it in B. 
they should be like S tier for anyone advanced. Push ups are amazing for your serratus interior. They're amazing for your joints. They're amazing for hypertrophy. You can load them easily, contrary to what people think. First off, you can add a deficit, which you guys have seen me do this, and I'll have three 45 pound plates stacked on my back. You just either need someone to help you with it or you got to use a backpack or something. It's easier than you think to load these. And most of you cannot do that unless you guys are benching like 400 like me. You should have no reason to be loading three 45 pound plates on your back and i'm going all the way down into the deepest stretch possible literally like it's mobility work which is one of the reasons i program this and then i protract as hard as possible on the concentric as well to get that serratus interior that pec minor that end range tricep activation that's going to really help out your joints help out your lockout strength Guys, this trains mobility, it trains strength, it trains stability, it trains joint resiliency, hypertrophy out the ass. It's one of the best chest exercises, but everyone shies away from it because they picture someone down on their knees doing fucking, you know, regular push-ups. You got to learn to modify this to add a progression or regression to it. There's a lot of women who come to me that can literally bench with an arch like 135 and can't even do like a set of 15 push-ups. That's not acceptable to me. Like you better be pushing 15 push-ups perfect full range if you're benching 135 as a female um and then my guys you'd be dude i shit you not i've given this to guys who bench in the fours and they can't even do deficit push-ups for like 15 20 reps like they die out too quick why because their work capacity is super low their mobility's trash and their stability's trash so the second they get into that full retraction at the bottom they're like wiggling around and that's why i like these kind of progress like that um, that's my tier list guys. These are the exercises that I just program kind of on a semi-regular basis. And I try to include a few that are, I don't know, hot takes as well. Like the overload work I don't really program, but I just need to think of other stuff on here. If I miss any exercises, feel free to let me know. This is my video. This is what I think. Again, remember this is specific to my paradigms. It's not specific to you guys. So I want you to just kind of take this with a grain of salt. I don't love these videos because of that, but I wanted to make a fun one for you guys. Catch y'all in the next one. Love you guys.